I remember Forest fans at Barnsley singing to me, what a waste of money. All right, big man, Fergie, yeah, so Alex Ferguson, I'm like, what are you want? Is this a wine up? up? Yeah. User a <laughs> disgrace. <laughs> and I said to her mom, can I have my hair done like Gary Shaw, a blonde bob? <laughs> and she said, I don't think that's going to work, son. And he just turned around and he said, I'll get you Liverpool. <laughs> Welcome to a Lifting the Lid. Sidders, how are we doing? Very, very well. How are you? I'm all good, mate. I can't complain. Who have we got on today? Today, we have got a striker that played in an era where, for me, the calibre of strikers was probably at its highest in his country. We're talking Shearer, Sutton, York, Cole, Players. Sheringham, Ferdinand, Fowler. And for me, this striker was up there with them when he was in his pomp. Um, and that striker is Stan Collymore. Stan Collymore, what a player. Yeah, exactly. And what are we talking to Stan about? We're talking to Stan about decisions uh, right across the board, football, transfers, clubs that he went to, clubs that he, that he may know, uh, not have gone to. So we know what Stan's like. It's going to be down the line. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be truthful. Let's do it. Buzzing for this. Let's get him out. Stan Collymore, everyone. <laughs> It feels like TFI Friday back in the day. Chris Evans and how are you, mate? I'm very well. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, it's been a while out. at the Villa, Stephen. You've, you've brought the sun out. I have brought the sun out. We're we're nearly there. You mentioned <laughs> your team there, Villa. Massive, massive fan. Who were your idols growing up? But Gary Shaw. Blonde hair, yeah. Bob, mm -hmm. Peter Wig, big Peter Wig. He was yeah. used to have claret and blue um, sweatbands on. So I, I've, I've still got claret and blue sweatbands. Um, you just walk around the house with claret and blue. Occasionally. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my mum, bless her. Hello, mum. She's 90. I remember saying to her as a kid, I mean, bear in mind, my hair was sort of like wavy. Well, it's yeah. not afro, it's just kind of light brown and wavy. And I said to her, mum, can I have my hair done like Gary Shaw, a blonde bob? <laughs> And she just looked at me and uh, wedge, not yeah. a bob. And she said, I don't think that's going to work, son, somehow. <laughs> you so I was gutted. So I had yeah. like, a, just all my dreams went. We're, we're here featuring the, uh, the FA Cup. What was your earliest memories of the FA Cup? Earliest memories of the FA Cup, pretty much like anyone my age, I'm, I'm not long gone 50, you would wake up super excited about, usually about quarter to eight, and yeah. you'd be kind of like, you'd get up and you'd run downstairs. And, and you'd switch the telly on and have seven or eight hours of pure football mm. coverage. Bus would pull up at the stadium. You'd see the fans with the flags. There'd always be two or three dignitaries that they'd, you know, Elton yeah, John, yeah. what do you think? And he's in his big glasses and he's, was so you know, cool, wasn't it? it was, it was so amazing. Good. So from, from that perspective, those are my early memories of switching on the TV at eight o'clock and not switching it off till eight, nine o'clock at night and then watching match of the day and watching, yeah. you know, extended highlights again. And what were your earliest memories of playing in the FA Cup? Um, Stafford Rangers versus Burnley, I think it was 1990, and I was super excited. So I was an apprentice at Warsaw, left after about five or six months, hated it. It was boot what? camp. Why? Because, and that's one of the, the, the first decision I made in, in professional football, because the coach is a guy called Ray Train. Ray Train played in the Carlisle team. They had one season in the top division, 71-72. Yeah. And you'll have both come across many guys, Steve in particular, playing in a dressing room. You'll have come across guys that basically were from the generation that pretty much went from army boot camp to football. Clubs would go yeah. and train yeah. at, uh, when I was at Crystal Palace, it was Steve Coppell, the crazy gang of Wimbledon were going to Aldershot to, to train. But there was a very big link between, in the, in the 80s and 90s, of, right, you're all going to go and run round a pitch 20 times, 20 laps. The one at the front is the fittest, the one at the back is, yeah. the, is the unfittest, which is nonsense. Bad, we, we'd, right. we'd look at that now as flat earthism. So, Ray Train was as old school as it was possible to get. I remember him saying, right, we've got to sweep, the, uh, sweep and mop the dressing rooms, all the kit out for your pro, boots would be sparkling, and you would have to sweep Fellows Park after a game. So they'd also just play Grimsby, 
you'd come in on a Sunday and you'd sweep the terrace. I'd be at the top. There'd be another guy here, another guy here, and you'd sweep everything down, pick it up, and you'd have... The actual terracing. The actual terracing. Yeah. So, at Warsaw, when I went, because I didn't have a football background, um, I went from a very small town playing Sunday football, uh, junior football, into the professional game. Whereas lots of the kids that were already apprentices, they'd played in Birmingham, and they were already associated with Birmingham or Villa or with Warsaw or with... Coventry, so they understood what was coming. And it was boot camp, and it just broke me. I thought I was just, just going to turn up and play football and express myself, yeah. and, um, and it, he saw ability in me, and because he saw ability in me, I was always the one that, when the whistle blew, right, chaps, well done, see you tomorrow, you get to the gate about 100 yards, not you! Uh, well, you bring it back. And come back and he'd run me oh, wow. round a track, and, you'd just, and it was just horrific. So I left, um, I said to my mum, I said, if this is what it is, I don't want a part of this. Left, two days later, um, a guy called Barry Powell um, called me. Barry Powell used to play for Derby County in their heyday, the club heyday, just after, I think. And he was youth team coach at Wolves. And he said, we'll take you. He said, you did really well for Warsaw against us in the Youth Cup. And I went like that. Uh, first game, second game was Wolves against West Brom. Um, why, why was that? Why do you reckon you went like that? Is that just because you felt, was you comfortable in that environment or it just suited you, the, 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 the coaching? The, the difference in the two men, Steve, was I had a conversation with Brendan Rodgers when he was at Swansea and it was a night before they played Liverpool. And I was talking to him about my son at the time, about he, he, my son, fantastic player. Um, but he got to a point and he was very shy, very quiet, and then he went on and did something else. He said, Dad, I don't want to do this. I said, fine. I said, but yeah, there aren't going to be second mm. chances here. And I said to Brendan, what do you do with youngsters? Because he'd been at Chelsea. Yeah. You know, his whole yeah. thing is he's developing yeah. younger Absolutely. players. And he said, Stan, give them the carrot. They'll no longer accept the stick. And Ray Train was all stick. Barry Powell was like Brendan Rogers, all carrot. I want you to do well. I believe in you. And it's just... When you t you're talking to a 17-year-old and saying, uh, I believe in you, uh, as opposed to, uh, you've scored two goals, but you should have scored three. Run round a track. And you've yeah. you run round a track. Or you, you, that bar is always yeah. Yeah, unattainable. Yeah, yeah. That glass ceiling is always, you can never break it. So Barry Powell was amazing. I was there for another few months. Um, scored goals in the youth team, scored goals in games with first team and reserves. Still got released because they had Steve Bull at the club, Andy Much, two or three other strikers. Um, and then I drifted into non-league, Stafford Rangers. Yeah. The first five or six months found difficult to transition. A new manager came in and said, you can go that way or you can go that way right now. If you want to go that way, get out. Um, and so I trained hard, played games, scored goals in the conference. There were some very, very good teams in there. And there were men. They were going to hurt you. They were going to go through you. They were going to teach they, you a lesson. And were they as well? Yeah, yeah they were. <laughs> uh, I've got the scars. I've got, actually, I've got a Dennis Wise stud mark here, which you, you, I might get into to signature it's one still day. still there, is it? It's still there. Yeah. But he's left a proper stud, oh, he stud was, in me. He anyway. was such a wind-up merchant. Um, so we got into the FA Cup first round. Burnley. Burnley. You must be and mate, But they were fourth division then. Right. But it's still, still Burnley. Yeah. It was like they did, yeah. you know, I've always been a bit of a football geek. So, you know, their time in the early 60s, they were as good as anybody in the mm. country. Um, scored an own goal. Ah. Ball comes over. Dopey Collymore is stood flat-footed. It's machine goes in. Uh, there was about 5,000 there. Burnley brought a couple of thousand fans. And I'm like, I'm never going to play professional football now. Yeah. I actually found the clip the other day on YouTube of Stafford Rangers... Uh, uh, fan site sent it. It was very funny to see me as a, as an 18 year old just sort of trudging back going, that's it now, no football for me. <laughs> okay. Did you actually think that though? Do you think, yeah. I was playing for I Stafford, think you I'm not going well, to it's, pla it's a platform, yeah. isn't it? You know, if, you, if you're a youngster and you're at a club, a pro club, um, you know, you'll make your debut and you often will get four or five games if they think you're really good. And after that four or five games, they'll say, yeah, he's, he's ready or we'll send him out on loan. This very much felt like this is a league club. Um, it's, a, it's a big environment in terms of this one-off game. Um, you fluffed your lines because all of those games, don't forget, 
on Football Focus on a Saturday or a Sunday, it'd be like, and Stafford Rangers lost against Burnley. Yeah. Yeah, the unfortunate young lad, Collie Moore, yeah. scored an own goal. Um, so, yeah, it very much felt like um, that, that that was it. It was November 1990. Got invited down to Crystal Palace for a trial. Stayed with a family in Biggin Hill. And got the week out of the way. Right, bright. So training with the first team, to be fair, straight away. There was no kind of, you're over in pitch Z. Straight in. Straight it. in. And I thought, that's a bit odd in itself. Um, and I got called to Steve Koppel's office and he said, do you want to play for Crystal Palace? I can, I can see him now. Do you want to play for Crystal Palace? <laughs> Is this Steve? Is, Is this Steve? <laughs> Come and sit on here, pal. He's, he's, he's sitting there with the deepest voice in the world. Do you want to play? And I said, yes. He said, get yourself home and I'll see you tomorrow. So I had the owner of Stafford Rangers take me back to Cannock. I packed a head tennis bag with everything I owned. That was it. Next morning I got up, at, uh, went to Wolverhampton Station. That's when this life that I'm in now started. I'm 20 years of age and I've gone to Crystal Palace that have finished third in the old first division. And Alan Smith, Steve Koppel, Wally Downs from the Crazy Gang. And Andy Gray came out and trained in a sheepskin <laughs> coat with a yellow bib over the top. <laughs> was everyone How, just like, what? And, every, and nobody, nobody else batted an eyelid. It was cold, he needed to be warm, and that was it. Well, so it wasn't even... It, what, no it, wasn't, like, it what? wasn't a skit. No. He trained in a sheepskin coat because he Come was cold. Come out like Del Boy. <laughs> <laughs> like Motti. Walks out like Motti. And trains. And trains well. Um, but that was very much the sort of crazy gang philosophy that was being almost injected into yeah. that Palace team. Andy Thorne and Eric Young had come from um, Wimbledon. Mm, yeah. Wally Downs was the coach. He hadn't long come. And he was arguably the architect of the crazy gang. Mm. Um, but there was a black click and the white click, and the white click was Jeff Thomas, Alan Pardew, Alan, um, as always, if he was chocolate, he'd eat himself. <laughs> so um, many people have yeah. said Always that, had that. his little toiletry bag, even then. Toiletry bag, people would come in with a bar of cobalt and do under your armpits. Sheepskin jackets. Yeah, do, your arm, do, do under your armpits, yeah. do your hair, and then you'd be out. Yeah, our lad was like a, a, his little, little bag. Um, Gareth Southgate and Andy Woodman yeah, were young yeah. members of this little clique. And the two cliques didn't like each other. There was, there was a really? lot of, yeah, there was a lot of, there was respect. Yeah. Because they played with each other and they helped each other and they were a very good team. And what did I learn? I learned to get my head down, um, to get anywhere near this team, you're going to have to work incredibly hard. Um, Steve Koppel saw me as a wide man, so I played a lot of my games at Palace as a, as a winger, tallest winger in the world. How did you find that? Horrible. Yeah, did you look... Just stuck out there. I made my debut against, um, against QPR, and it was, it was quite surreal because I you know, played at Stafford Rangers, but going in the crowd in the top flight, London Derby, um, and I'm stuck out on the left wing, and I hated it. But I learned a lot from playing there, which then helped me later on in, in my career. Because you decided, didn't you, to drop down the league? Yeah. Was that a tough decision? Yeah, it was the toughest decision because uh, I was actually quite scared, like genuinely scared, because I'd been at Palace at that point for about two years. I was living in Croydon, in Diggs, and it was a very comfortable existence. Um, so I drove from Croydon to uh, Roots Hall, and... Colin Murphy just said to me, I want you to play as a centre forward. I know you've been playing as a left winger for Palace. He said, I've worked with Mick Harford. Um, and I thought, bloody hell, it's like, I hope he doesn't want me to be Mick Harford. <laughs> I'm going to be like elbow, <laughs> sharpening my elbows. Uh, I've worked with Mick Harford and John Fashionu. And he said, I believe you can go further than them. And I thought, they all say that mm. to you kind of thing. Um, made me debut. Absolutely terrified, small ground roots all, but it was, this is it. You are now a centre forward for a championship club that are battling a real relegation. Yeah, this isn't Wednesday night at no. Tooting and Mitcham playing Ipswich Reserves. It's on you. This is proper. Yeah. There's protests going on uh, against Vic Jobson, the owner, and it was the first time in my life 
that I said, this is not only a good decision, this is a great decision. You could have stayed at Palace and been in the reserves for another two or three years. Mm -hmm. You could have gone to Wimbledon and not got ahead of Effa Nakoku and Dean Oldsworth yeah, and yeah. one of the others. You've gone to a club and now it's on you. And, you've, and in this one game, you've thrived. And I ended up scoring 18 in 30. You kept them up. Yeah. We stayed up. Yeah. Um, By we, the way, you, you've kept them up and he said, now we stayed up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do. I, I, out of all the clubs I played for, I mean, like I say, I'm a Villa fan and it was horrific. My time at Villa was bad. Bad life decisions. Um, bad. Um, didn't think about it tactically or technically, which you'll come to. But I always say we with South End because when we stayed up, the last game of the season was against Luton. Uh, Kerry Dixon and John Artson were playing for him. And it was nil-nil and stayed up. And the fans, the glee and the joy, they just had pure relief. We cannot believe we're staying in the championship for another season. Mm. Especially bearing in mind they've, you know, they're struggling now. Yeah. yeah. You know, could well go out there, been, been teetering on the edge of going out of, the, out of the league for a few years. So to be hoisted above everybody on the pitch, having your boots nicked, being left in your pants, feeling that you've contributed something... Uh, again, in terms of a, of a decision whereby you're given three or four options, one was more lucrative, Wimbledon, one was safer, stay at Palace, or the other one, go to this club that most people had never heard of, that are in a relegation scrap and help keep them up, was an amazing feeling. So you go from Southend to Forest. Yeah. So obviously it's a no-brainer to go to Forest, yeah. but it still must have been hard for what, for what you're saying there, that... You know your experiences and what you had at Southend to to leave that. Although you're going on to New Pastures, which is going to be better for your career, it must have been hard to leave Southend for the. It was, but I was only at Southend for six months, 18 goals, 30 games. Um, wow, that's a that's a hell of a. Yeah. And then Brian Clough came to see me for Southend against Notts County in Nottingham, and I was papping myself. What, you um, knew he was coming to watch? I knew he was coming oh. to watch. And Barry would tell you everything. Yeah. Yeah. In, you know, bizarre Barry was, but a, a, a great character. And he said, I mean, he was trying to, he was a used car salesman. Yeah. <laughs> Stan scored two today, that's another 50 grand on <laughs> the field. <laughs> exactly. So he would tell me everything. Um, he'd, he'd often say, I've been on to Big Ron, pal. Uh, he'd always say, I've been on to Big Ron, pal. And uh, you could end up being, going from here to Villa. And I'm like, this is not real. Um, but he told me, he, uh, he said, uh, Cluffy and Ronnie Fenton there. And I had, I had one bad game for Palace, genuinely one bad game, and that was it. I was like, nah, it's just, that's Brian Clough. He's, he's there somewhere and he's watching me to ascertain whether um, I could go to a club that he's won everything with. Um, so that didn't happen. Brian Clough didn't want to pay Bolt at the two million fee. Then we got to the end of the season. Um, I went on holiday. I had a phone call from Barry saying, um, we've done a deal with Forrest. Get yourself back and meet Frank Clark. Frank was just sort of the opposite of Barry. Barry would have a thousand words and I want you to do this and rely on your sort of really tug on your heartstrings. And Frank was like, I'd love you to come to Nottingham Forest. Obviously, we've just lost Brian and Keno's gone as well to Man United. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of money, but we're prepared to pay it. And I, again, I believe in you. But I remember driving straight from Croydon to Nottingham. Nobody knew. Went to the city ground, saw a red door open and a, and a kit man. And I said, I've just signed for the club. I said, can I have a tracksuit? He had to give it the, the OK with somebody at the club. And they said, yeah, he really has signed for the club. <laughs> wow. Put this Nottingham Forest tracksuit on from the previous season. Went to see me mates. And I was just like, just kept on doing that. That's it's cool. like, there's the tree and the, yeah, it's yeah. just mad. And, it, and I was 23 and I'm just trying to think now, you know, you, you think of players, Jack Grealish, uh, know fairly well. Villa fan, plays for his club. I hope he does that. I hope he did that. Mm. I hope when he went in an England dressing room that, he got the. He had to look at the shirt and and all of that kind of stuff. Were you stuff. like that, Steve? When you went to? Um, I was like, uh, uh, well, I signed for Chelsea because it was more of a family. All my family Chelsea. You know the connections yeah. I've got. Yeah. It was. A, there was moments where I was looking down. I was like, wow, 
Like it was. It it's a double a, take, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it took of... me. It took me four or five months, like at Chelsea, to, to to really feel like I was a part of that club. Did you, were you more nervous signing for Chelsea because it was Chelsea and it's all your? Family? Yeah, 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 exactly that. And they, they was obviously one of the top teams in Europe. Jose was just come on the scene, so yeah, they had all that that stigma as well that was that was with it, but. I know exactly the feeling. You look down, and not just there. It's, it's on the club track suits. It's on, you know, the kit bag. It's everywhere. You like, and it's just everywhere around you. And you you're in this bubble, and you just get soaked into it. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. So, um, for me, the step up was a, a significant one. I moved back to the Midlands. I made a conscious effort, and again about the, the theme of decisions. From Forest, pretty much through Liverpool and Villa, I lived in Cannock, my hometown, and. At Forest and at Villa, the media angle was, this is a really good decision, he's surrounding himself with his friends and family. Right. At Liverpool, it was, he was never committed enough to move to the city of Liverpool. And so it's the same, it took me 45 minutes to get in mm. to, to Melwood, yeah. uh, Liverpool, and it would, exactly the same time as it would take uh, Don Matteo or Neil Ruddock driving from Southport. Yeah. But That's nonsense. The, the perception no, no, no. was that he's going from the Midlands to the Northwest rather than, you know, equal distance. Um, do I regret that decision in terms of Liverpool? Yes, because it was used against me and it was uh, every, every good game I had, it was never mentioned, every poor game I had, he hasn't committed to Liverpool. Um, but signing for Nottingham Forest, it was the right decision, the right move to make. A great club, an absolutely great club. Um, and then the next season, in the, uh, my first season in the Premier League, we finished third. Um, 50 goals, 68 games. Um, it's a joke of a record. Um, a very good team, Stuart Pearce, Steve Stone, Brian Roy, um, Lars Bohinen. Um, yeah. A really good team. And that is still a record. Us and Newcastle, I think, are the mm. only two teams that have been promoted and that's the highest finish. We both finished on identical points. Well, um, why was this team so successful, like Forest, in terms of the players that you had there were, were good players? I think that the team that went down, I mean, it was one of those cliches. They were, they, the end of that season that they went down, that kind of famous cliche, too good to go down, was mm. used. Stuart Pearce had an injury. Roy Keane was amazing. He had an amazing season, but they went down. Um, I think, that, I think that Brian wasn't Brian that we knew right. at that point. I think that speaking to some of the lads, he was a little bit more aloof. He had his own issues and problems. So uh, leadership became a bit of an issue of the club. Um, but in terms of the personnel, I mean, Frank Clark firstly wanted to get out of the, Premier, out of the, the championship. Yeah. So he bought Lars Bohinen, which made a big difference. We actually started the championship season Playing 4-4-2, I think it was myself and Gary Bull, Steve Bull's cousin, or myself and Lee Glover, myself and Jason Lee. And we lost our first six games. And I remember Forest fans at Barnsley singing to me, what a waste of money. At that point, uh, did you think, me, what a terrible decision to come exactly, in? Uh, yeah. Exactly that. I thought, that isn't, it's, yeah. it's, it's ain't going to get any worse than this. You've got fans that have seen Trevor Francis scoring a goal as the sort of... Mm -hmm. um, first million pound player and now 3,000 of them are thinking what a waste of money. What is that like to you both? If you're having a bad game and the fans are getting on your back, does it just mentally do you? Uh, in, my, in my terms, I, look, I was a workhorse, so I, we could all go into games and you know, a pass could go astray or you miss a goal or you miss a chance and it happens. Yeah. But I think with fans, as long as they see yeah. you working for their badge, then they'll, they'll, they'll respect that and they'll applaud that. Whereas if someone's having a bad day and they get subbed off and it, that can manifest, you know, that's when fans can, can go against you. Did it, so get, to, did it so get to you? For, that was the only time. Right. Uh, the only yeah. time in my career. I mean, I had a great relationship with Villa fans despite having two really bad years there. I mean, they had a big, huge banner on the halt and Liverpool fans were always very gracious and always have been. Because, I mean, now, um, you know, just finding out with the kids using the stats. I mean, the only stat was goals for me or for Robbie Fowler. Yeah. I actually found out, somebody tweeted me the other day and said, did you know in your two seasons you got a double-double? You got a double in assists and a double in goals. I was like, wow. great, <laughs> superb. Um, but 
in terms of um, the decision, not that I made, but Frank Clark made, was we had a big team meeting in Nottingham. We'd lost five out of six games in the championship. And we were second from bottom. And he said, I've got to change it. So he brought Lars Bohinen in, stuck him in a five in midfield and said, Stan, you're going to play up top on your own. And it changed overnight. So we pretty much stayed with that system until we got promoted. And then Frank said, I think it might be a little bit of a stretch <clears throat> sticking a rookie in his first Premier League season up top on his own. Um, Brian Roy's available. What do you think? And he actually called me. It was only the, one, the only one time uh, on, uh, that a manager called me and asked my opinion on, a, on another player. Wow. And I said, Brian Roy, I said, fantastic. He was at Ajax, won the UEFA Cup under Van Gaal, went to Foggia when the big money was in Italy. He came and he revolutionised the way I thought about football, about movement, and, um, and we had a really good partnership in the Premier League. So, in terms of the decision to go to Nottingham Forest, overwhelmingly thumbs up. Uh, but again, you're only one decision away from success or failure, yeah. and, and that is what you carry with you as a footballer. Was there was other clubs involved? There yeah, was, was, was Fiorentina was, 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 was Man United, Manchester United. So my agent was Paul Stretford. Yeah. Paul Stretford, at that point, he's, he still looks after Wayne Rooney's yeah. career, 20 years on. Um, my, so he was my agent at Nottingham Forest towards the end, and... Famous phone call happens. Again, decisions change things, other people's decisions. I had a phone call f driving from Nottingham and the phone rang. And it was Stretford, he said, I've got somebody who wants to speak to you. I'm under contract with Nottingham Forest. All right, big man, Fergie, yeah, so Alex Ferguson. I'm like, it, 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 what you want? Is this a wind up? Yeah. And I stopped the car on the roundabout. There's a few garages there near Derby County Cricket Club. And he said, would love you to come. He said, be patient, it'll happen. And I'm like, amazing. At that time, Fergie, around two or three days later, called Frank Clark, and Frank Clark told his secretary, Carol, blank the calls, just ignore the calls. Because Frank didn't know what to do at that point. He didn't know whether to accept a, an offer. Yeah. I was under contract, so I didn't have to sell me. There was no sort of free... Uh, the Bosman, I don't think, had even started at that point. Um, and I remember Paul Stretford saying, don't worry, it's all happening. Back of the Nottingham Post, Stan Collymore this week will sign for Man United. I'd just been to Old Trafford and scored the first goal in this win. That had, so it was all on. Then I didn't hear for, from Stretford for about five days, which was very unusual because he was my agent. We spoke yeah. every day. And it was a very sort of close relationship. And I was ringing him, leaving messages and what have you. Five days, I'm like, this is super unusual. So, turn on Sky Sports News like most players do when yeah. it comes to... Andy Cole, breaking news, signs for Manchester United. I mean, and that, at that time, was the equivalent of, I don't know, Harry Kane going to Arsenal yeah. Yeah, what, yeah. tomorrow. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, and the story I was told was is that Fergie called Frank for the third or fourth time, said, bugger this, I'm not going to bother anymore. Has a phone call with Kevin Keegan about Keith Gillespie. Yeah. Keegan wanted Gillespie. And at the end of the conversation, um, Keegan says, yeah, great, we'll sort the deal. Keith Gillespie coming here, fantastic. I'll, I'll speak to you later, Alex. And Fergie said, in his own autobiography, I thought I'd just ask him about Andy Cole. Expecting him to turn around and turn to get lost. Yeah. He said, what about Andy Cole? And Keegan went quiet for about four seconds and Fergie knew, said, I knew I had him wow. then. He said, because a manager that was desperate to keep his player under any circumstance, he says, Come straight back. Yeah. laughs. Or, yeah. He said, that pause, I knew. And if you remember, Kevin Keegan had to go out onto the steps. Of, yeah. He's like, Geordie Nation, yeah. trust me yeah. or I go. Yeah. Um, and I was devastated. Paul Stretford eventually called me and after a few expletives were exchanged and he just turned around and he said, I'll get you Liverpool. Again, decisions. The decision I made was you've just got to get to the end of the season now, do your very best for Forest, and see where the cards fall. 
So Arsenal were interested, Bruce Rioc. Um, Liverpool, Fiorentina. Um, and I sat down with Paul Stretford, I sat down with family. And I basically looked at it and said, how many opportunities are you going to get in life to play for one of either Liverpool or Man United? Yeah. They just don't come along very often. So I made the decision to sign for Liverpool. Um, didn't go down, down very well with Nottingham Forest fans at all. Um, I went back with Liverpool to the city ground the week before the Liverpool 4 Newcastle 3 game. We lost. And there was a one kilometre cordon put round the city ground by Nottinghamshire Police because I'd been sent a scrapbook with, and it was obviously a kid, that had every picture of me in a forest kit with the heads cut off and like blood kind of like spurting out oh. my neck. And so the police said, we better take this seriously. And I had to get off the bus with the Liverpool players with not a soul around for a kilometre around the stadium. And I got booed for 90 minutes. Well, you made the decision to sign up for Liverpool and then you're playing an FA Cup final against... Man United. Your biggest rivals, yeah. Man United at Wembley. What was it like, the build-up... First of all, the build-up to that, in terms of it being the rivalry of Liverpool, Man United, this is an FA Cup, yeah. biggest tradition in English football, yeah. and then on the day as well. They hadn't played in a final since 1977 um, together. England's two biggest clubs. So you can imagine, I remember the lead up to the game, particularly because there were a lot of similarities between, you know, there was the class of 92, there was Fowler, McManaman, you know, the Spice Boys, whatever you want to call them. And so that was massively inflated during the weeks leading up and before the, the, the games against them in the league. And for you as well, because that's the team you were going to go to. And Precisely, then, yeah. At that point, it wasn't, it wasn't so much so. I'd already got a... You know, once you play, for, once you play one game for Liverpool, Man United are your mortal yeah. enemy. But that was at the end of this, the first season, so there was never any thought of, oh, I should have gone there or wanted to go there or any payback because I didn't go there. But the, the way that this game was built up, Thinking about it as, as players at the time, we were all cocky and we were all confident. You all think you can kind of reinvent the wheel and I'm going to score a hat trick against them. And um, is that it was always built up to fail because of it, it was relentless. It was, um, you know, Redknapp and Keane, it was uh, McManaman against Cantonar, it was Fowler against, it, it was just incessant. Um, and what I remember about the game was that A, after the game it was said it was a poor cup final. And I, th and I remember thinking for years, it, it, it wasn't, it was just really hard. Yeah. You couldn't breathe, you couldn't get any space. You couldn't get the ball at your feet and go and run at somebody. Somebody was on you straight away. And Roy Keane wrote in his autobiography, it was the most difficult game he ever played in. He couldn't get any space. Now for Roy Keane to say that, Bearing in mind the battles that he had, he said, I couldn't get anything that, I couldn't do anything that I wanted to do. At that point, I got subbed off 76 minutes, 77 minutes. Uh, Rushy came on, I think it might have been his last performance for Liverpool, uh, last appearance. JMO comes out for a cross, I think fluffs it in Cantona, sort of side volleys yeah, it in. Yeah. Um, we, we had an open top bus the next day. And we thought, Christ, this is Liverpool. They ain't, they ain't going to no. turn out for a, for a team that loses. And there was tens of thousands turned out. It wasn't um, after, like, Madrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're after several million. But, and this scouser, <laughs> he had a, 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 a homemade board. And we were, the bus was, bus was coming along. And we got him. It was like, you know, well done. Lad, you know, OK. It was against the Manx, but well done. Good effort. And it was just user of <laughs> disgrace. <laughs> well, that's that's, like, that's how much it means to know, yeah. isn't it? It was like, because it was Man United for that bloke, yeah. don't come home. Yeah. Don't get, what are you doing on a bus? <laughs> I remember the other thing about the open top bus parade is, is that Stig Inge Bjornaby, left back, Norwegian left back, had his, had, was facing the back of the bus. And... We got to the end of the parade and the, and the bus put his foot down to, right, let's get back to, to Anfield and pick the cars up and go home. And there was an overhanging tree and this tree just cleared him out. Took him out, no <laughs> To way. the back of the bus. 
to this to this <laughs> day, a, I've it never. It was a bad idea. The he bus was he, he, he was <laughs> ten steps in from the front of the bus, and the and the it just cleared him all the way to the end. And all the lads had ducked, and Stig was the only one that <laughs> bang. Um, Alf, it was everyone just in pieces. Just in, well, you can imagine like Neil Ruddock and. <laughs> Fowler and all that. I mean, the, the, the whole thing about that dressing room was that it was, um, I mean, Nottingham Forest dressing room, uh, Palace, hard men, old school, had to earn your stripes. South End, lots of journeymen, bit weather beaten by the sport over many years, playing in the lower leagues, honest, honest blokes. Um, Forest, you know, a really solid dressing room, good lads, pretty much marshalled by Stuart Pearce. We went to a madness gig and he said, right, we've all got to go. We all had to go into Birmingham. Everybody had to buy Doc Martins. We went to, we went to Greece and played Olympiacos in a friendly. And the night before, Ike Athens were playing Rangers in the UEFA Cup. And Stuart Pearce said, we're going in with the Rangers fans. We stood the in the- The night before a game? The, the 3,000 Rangers fans <laughs> with Union Jacks. And we're stood amongst them, and they're all going up to Stuart Pearce, going, legends, you know, unionists, yeah, yeah, and yeah. England, you know, love you, but Pearce and what have you. And we're getting, there was a, thankfully, there was a net over, and the Ike fans were throwing coins and bottles, and like, and Pearce wow. was like, we're, we're, we're going to stand with the Rangers fans and watch. So I have stood in the away end at a Rangers game with my Nottingham Forest teammates, and also been to a Madness concert where the captain mandated that everybody had to wear Doc Martins. <laughs> what That's a hero. Brilliant. Do, do, do. <laughs> You're proper giving it. Do, 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 do. it like everybody was. But it, it, it oh. went into where, uh, you know, everybody had to go into to buy Doc Martins. You know, we had a tape uh, in the dressing room and everybody could choose one song. And the, and the playlist was like chosen by Piercy. It'd be like Sex Pistols or it'd be The Clash or what have you. And I'd choose a bit of funk or soul or what have you. And it was all like meticulous. So that dressing room was solid, but it was run by Piercy. Yeah. So the Liverpool dressing room um, was the, the complete opposite of Crystal Palace and pretty much Forest, because you had a, a whole group of senior players that, that ruled the dressing room. Uh, Paul Stewart, Jan Mulby, um, Nigel Clough, Ian Rush, Mark Wright. And then you had this, they were, they were in that corner, John Barnes, over in that corner was McManaman and Redknapp and um, Fowler messing around in the Scousers. Carragher was in there as well. And then in the middle was the new signings and some of the others. And it was, it was incredible, really, because it was the first time in my life that I um, had ever bothered about, as you can tell, cars or clobber or... Right. It was like Jamie Redknapp would be like, right, boys, uh, we're playing Chelsea. We're staying at wherever it was. Um, down the Brompton Road, one of the hotels on the Brompton Road we stayed at. Um, Selfridges closes at, uh, Arvey Nicks closes at nine o'clock. They've closed it for the last hour for us, the night before playing Chelsea. Wow. Go in, take half a dozen bits, wrapped up, gone. Um, wow. The, the, the cup final, and it was, it was, you know, it was all about cars and, and, and girls and you name it. And that bled into um, the narrative that there was a lot of playboys and stuff. Whereas the reality is, we had a, we had a good the, the season with the Newcastle game. Mm. Went fairly uh, right the way to the end, the title race. Got into the cup final against Manchester United. If that could have quite easily been a Southampton or yeah. teams that we'd have be, we, we, we'd beaten. So we were small margins. Um, but the decisions that we made as a group to live a little was used against us. That was a, that probably as a collective was a poor decision. I know it really gets on the go of Robbie Fowler. He hates to be tagged into the Spice Boys. Mm. I don't care. I think Jamie Redknapp doesn't like it. Uh, I think not, nobody likes it because it's seen as this is a this is a, a, a badge of shame. But there was the, the, there was a, a theory behind it, and I think that the theory behind it was. Although the vast majority of the time we were professional, winning games, uh, I actually thought that one of the reasons we didn't win the title was because we, we, didn't, we conceded too many goals. I had a look the other day, the stats held up defensively. Robbie Fowler and I, I think it was 102 goals between us in two seasons, plus half again in assists. That first season was a change. Um, mental, scoring goals for fun. So 
We're talking about small margins yeah. in a very good a Manchester United team that went on to dominate. But if I could shed a light on a story that probably separates the management, you know, I loved Roy Evans, but he was very much a, an uncle figure. Right. The first day that I went out to train at Melwood, Roy walks out onto the training pitch and Robbie Fowler grabs him round the head and gives him one of those like he did at school. <laughs> And I remember walking out, and I was the new signing, eight and a half million, British record signing, Billy Big Potatoes, got all the Liverpool gear on. And I thought, I wonder if anybody does that to Sir Alex Ferguson at Manchester United. Yeah, no chance. And just little things like that. You take a yard with somebody and you'll take another yard yeah. and another yard. Now, Robbie wasn't doing anything. He knew Roy. He mm. grew up with him. He, Roy was died in the wall Liverpool. But that little fine margin of discipline or perceived discipline was the difference. When the cup final suits were being talked about, we were at Melwood. J-Mo, David James was modelling for Armani. Great physique, monster, on the box. It was J-Mo's torso, brilliant. McAteer was doing head and shoulders adverts. Mm. Fantastic, great. And we're sitting there and it's like, right, John Barnes is like, right, let's choose the suits. Um, we know we're having Armani suits because J-Mo's hooked us up with them. In walks Giorgio Armani, tan, in white t-shirt, je jeans up here. <gasps> I'm not kidding, it was Giorgio Armani. <laughs> and, he's, and he's lackey, you know, he's kind of like swanning around like, yes, measure it. Giorgio Armani walks in, says hello to the lads and what have you. The guy from Armani has swatches of colours. I could see Roy Evans and the staff going, well, we're just going to stick with blue or grey, no yeah. worries. And then it becomes a kind of like, what about cream? What about a bit of torp? What about of... And that's how the white suits happened, is that the lads all agreed. And we all agreed because we thought, not because we were being flighty or disrespectful to the competition, we thought we were as cool as. Yeah. Fergie would keep a bottle on that. 100%. Going in and dragging gigs and sharp out of a party. Yeah. We didn't. He Fine probably won't let Mr Armani come in the training ground either, I couldn't believe it. No. Well, um, when I joined Liverpool, the last game of the season, the season before, I played for Forest, scored my last goal against Manchester City at the city ground. Liverpool were playing Villa and I was talking to, I was in communication with, with uh, Jamie Redknapp because I'd met them at an England get-together, so we swapped numbers. Robbie Williams was on the Liverpool team coach on the last day of the season going to Villa Park with them. That's unbelievable. It's just so random. Wow. But yeah, like you said, Roy Evans. Decisions. Yeah, decisions. Like the manager you know, made the decision yeah. to let that happen. So he has to. He, yeah. It's all right saying, you young twenty-two-year-olds that have been told, yeah, go on, you can go out and you can do, the, or you, you know, we'll we'll close Harvey Nichols for you for an hour. If you give players that, I mean, I'm sure it happens now. Yeah. But I couldn't imagine Sir Alex Ferguson or Jurgen Klopp or Thomas Tuchel or anybody else. Let in do a lipper on the back of the Chelsea team bus. <laughs> <laughs> One kisses. Yeah, you know, all the lads giving it that. Um, Two cool at the front, just going like. <laughs> see, I'm down with the kids as well. Do a lipper up front. Do a lipper. I never expected to throw that in the interview. Wow. Um, but but Roy, the the thing the thinking was Liverpool had already cemented whatever their position was. I mean, it's Aston Villa as well. It's not as if you know, you're not you're not, you're not playing in a in a pre-season friendly. Yeah. Robbie Williams was on the back seat of the team bus with the lads. So that's what I walked into. And at the end of that two years at Liverpool, my record stands up to scrutiny. Goal every other game, European Cup winners, Cup semi against PSG, lost narrowly to Man United, but there were, it was losing. There were lots of losing, but it was against good clubs in, in small margins. But the decision that Liverpool Football Club made to maybe make the environment a little more relaxed than Manchester United, enabled Manchester United to go like that mm. and Liverpool to stay where they were. And that wasn't rectified for years after. That lifestyle now is changing. Yeah. Not only outside of football, but more accepted yeah. in the dressing room. Yeah. So would you say you're, in your career, this was the point where mental health or other issues in terms of lifestyle decisions was now sort of being more quizzed at? The first time I, I sought or reached out uh, to anybody regarding my mental health was at Liverpool, towards the end. 
And I rang the physio, Mark Leather, who's funny, he's, again, this sort of whole Liverpool atmosphere and every, the, the banter atmosphere. He was called Judas because he, he, he left Blackburn as physio to get to Burnley or something. Really? So, oh, they called yeah. him, so they called him Judas. Um, and I called him up one day, I said, Judas, I'm not, I'm not feeling great. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I'm just, I'm just not feeling so grand. And you know, all right, we'll have a talk about it. It never went any further than there. I got to the end of the season, Paul Stretford walks into the players' lounge at Anfield, very small bar, families and friends, and he said, I want to have a word with you. And he walked out into the corridor and he said, Villa want you. And I just said, yes. I got to the end of that second season with Liverpool, still had a really good season with Robbie Fowler. Michael Owen was starting to get games. Michael Owen came on and scored on his... Uh, debut mm. with m playing alongside me at uh, Wimbledon at, at Sellers when they were when they were tenants at Sellers. So I knew this bright young kid was and he was getting games and they loved him and it was kind of like the whole you could see that happening. I thought, well, I'm going to be the one to potentially miss out. And the magic remedy was Villa. Yeah, my club want me. Um, everything else can just sort of disappear. It's kind of like everything's going to be great. And when I, the, the, the week leading up to signing, so Paul Stretford pulled me into the corridor outside the, 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 the players' lounge and he said, um, Doug Ellis really wants you. And then he said, what a great move for you. Go back to your club, go back to the Midlands. So I said, yes. Didn't think about any of the, the from, from a, uh, a football perspective. <clears throat> the money was double what Liverpool I was learning at Liverpool, which was incredible because I'd, I'd had two good seasons, but they weren't the two great seasons I had at Forest. And Brian Little, again, one of my heroes as a kid growing up, was the manager. Peter With was the European scout. It was, it was, Alan Evans was one of the first team coaches. It just sounds perfect. It was, yeah. it was too perfect. Yeah. But I was carrying into that something not right. And the only thing I can probably say is, and you made a really good point, Steve, about players now and what they're taking on board. Um, at Warsaw, at South End, at, Pal Warsaw, at, at Warsaw and, and Palace in particular, I was conditioned to go, right, you're not just this kid coming in to play football. This is professional football and this is very different. You know, when you, when you, when you come from London or one of the big cities, Manchester, but, and, you, and you're associated with a club from age 11 or 12, you get drip-fed it. Mm. You understand what the responsibilities are of playing for a, a Fulham or, a, or being involved in the professional ranks. I was completely wet behind the ears as to what professional football was. Right. It's ruthless. <laughs> it's, it's combative. It's, there's a lot of jealousy. There's, there's always somebody wanting to take your place, and you should be wanting to take their place. And I was very naive, very easygoing, very green. At Warsaw and at um, Crystal Palace, I had an idea and a grounding on what this career w was. That it wasn't always nice. It wasn't just about going out and training and doing flicks and tricks and scoring goals. There was a kind of, a, 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 could be quite a nasty underbelly to it. So, I have every sympathy for players nowadays that are taking on ever greater things, criticism from, you know, they, they, they're damned if they do, if they're damned if they don't, whatever they write on social media. But players that stick, Tyrone Mings, I like and I know fairly well. He sticks his head above the parapet in, in socialist issues. Marcus Rashford does. And I often think, how does that impact their mental health? Mm. Because they're getting a barrage of, you know, mostly well done, but you're always going to get, you're always going to see what somebody says, oh, holier than thou, you're this, you're that, yeah, yeah. you're the other. Stick to, you haven't scored for 10 games, maybe if you played. I didn't have that, but what I did have in the Liverpool um, experience was jealousy, was... Jealousy from who? Just, <laughs> at the beginning, Robbie Fowler and I didn't get on. On the pitch, we got on fine. Yeah. He reckons it, it was blown out of proportion. But I remember a game and we, we had a quick spat, a quick word, very early on in the season. We didn't speak pretty much for the two years. It was like Sheringham and, really, yeah. and Cole. Wow, I didn't know that. Um, 
I always remember one or two players being quite cutting and cruel about things and, and um, you, know, you know, comments. I remember joining up with England and a very high profile player saying some very cruel, cutting things. But football wise, I was going through you know, a, bit of a bit of a bad time at that point. And, and so being the person that I am, like now, you could say anything to me and on a normal, natural mental health day, I couldn't care less because I've been in it for 30 years. You, you, you do a radio phone in and a bloke comes on and goes, you're talking rubbish, I'm an Arsenal fan, da, 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 or a barrage of social media abuse because you've said, you know, what Luis Suarez did was a, dis was a disgrace, you know, and the Everest stuff. You expect it, you take it. But what I'd started to notice at Liverpool was, is that the criticism in a very big pond, you know, a, a, an internationally sort of acclaimed organisation where you're always having to be switched on, every microphone is taking everything in, is that I looked back at interviews and I could tell that there's something wasn't right. And it was, I think I was just hurt and upset by how cruel the industry could be. I think that up to that point, things had gone well on the pitch. I'd leave, I'd, I'd finish a game, go home to Cannock, see my friends and family, happy days. Didn't have loads of friends in football. But then when you start to invest in um, the, the, the Liverpool lads, as I did, um, and as you're at a club where there's so much more of a spotlight and scrutiny, it just started to unravel. I just started to see, I got to the, I felt as if I climbed to the top of a, a ladder, looked over into the secret garden. It wasn't what, it, what I expected it to be. British record transfer, the country's uh, biggest club. Um, and it felt like a disappointment. And once you feel that disappointment, it is very, very, you have, I always use Alan Shearer and Michael Owen as an example. In football, and Steve will know what I mean, if Alan Shearer was told, you've got to hop on one leg 3,000 times in the North Sea to get fit for the next two or three weeks, that's what he'd do. Eyes on the prize, nothing else matters. And I think that that can come from many things. Uh, being a strong person, a strong character, a great family, a great supportive family. Uh, I always remember Michael Owen saying, um, would play a game, score two goals at Anfield, go and have a game of snooker with my dad or a cup of tea or a beer or something. I didn't have that. I had, it was me and my mum. So my mum was getting much, much older, into her 70s, she's 90 now. And so I felt on my own. So then about decisions, I was starting to kind of like, what the players in the dressing room are saying to me is important. The newfound friends that I've made going into London, they're important. Instead of having what I have now, which is I've got the people that are close to me that I love and I adore and they love me back and judge me just for me. And, and, and at Liverpool, in the biggest spotlight, that's when it started. It manifested itself at Aston Villa. I'd, uh, uh, you know, I, could, I can look back and say, started the season, drove into Villa Park, radio, local radio on, stands back, Villa fan back home, great. And I was literally driving in on the Aston Expressway. You could see the, 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 the floodlights at Villa Park. It was a night game against Blackburn. And two days later, I'd been into the supermarket in Cannock, souvenir edition in the Express and Star, the equivalent of the Standard or the Chronicle in Newcastle. Stands back home. Uh, my, my school teacher had, had, had said what I was like at school in a souvenir edition. So the, 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 going to Villa, um, it was like going there, not being myself. Um, Brian Little decided to play me, Dwight York and Savo Milosevic. Very narrow on the pitch. Um, Jason Wilcox, Stuart Ripley, Alan Shearer tore us to shreds. We lost 4 0, my first game. And it all unravelled. We didn't win a game for seven or eight games. We went to Blackburn away. Uh, Savo spat in a, a, a couple of Villa fans. You're not fit to wear the shirt. I was making dreadful life decisions on who I was seeing, well documented stuff, but making poor decisions. And it was all to fill this increasing, um, I'm not confident of being Stan Collymore at Nottingham Forest or at Southend anymore. I need all of this mishmash and jigsaw to make me feel, to be accepted and feel comfortable. And I really worry that in a day and age where players have 10 million followers age 21, 22, the benchmark is really high. Everything they do is, is you know, they're, they're putting themselves out there on holiday and their gear and stuff. 
I take my hat off to a lot of them because a lot of them seem to be, um, and again, this is probably the academy system, teaching them from a very early age what you possibly can expect. I didn't have any of that. The kid walking into Warsaw and expecting to play a five-a-side and getting whistled back, run around the track, is that at Liverpool, the signs were there, but it manifested itself at Aston Villa, which was the wrong club, the wrong time, uh, the wrong manager. Brian Little got the sack, who was very um, sympathetic. John Gregory came in, and John Gregory, uh, and he knows, I've said this too, he's, he's like Alan Pardew, confident, yeah. cocky. He used to have, you know, training, he'd have his, he'd have his laces like Glenn Oddle around you, you know, tied all the way up here. He was a good midfielder, very good midfielder for Villa QPR <coughs> back in the day. He gets the job from Wickham, thinks this is my shot at the big time. And at first he tried to help. He said, um, he said, I'll give you the number nine. Because uh, I know how much that would be important to Peter With's old shirt. Uh, and he tried, but he also was stick, stick, stick to Bre Brendan Rodgers' carrot. Score two goals this week, should have scored a hat-trick. And that added to all the life choices that I was then making. I spoke to somebody the other day. Um, I wouldn't call him a friend, but I'd, talk, I'd say he's a, a, a colleague. And in recent years, they've made, they made one bad decision that then led to two or three others. Most solid person you'd ever meet. But, but it, they, it comes, like buses, it comes into, you make one, you chase another bad decision, you chase another bad decision. And that's what happened at Villa. And to be at my football club, where I walked in uh, one stand as a seven, eight-year-old, played on the centre circle as a 20-year-old and had a horrific time, and then had a microphone and a, and a set of cans on in my latter career. Um, so the sort of whole boy, man, sort of older man thing. Um, for it to be Aston Villa felt really cruel. Because if I'd have played like I did for Nottingham Forest at Aston Villa, I'd be a Villa legend. Yeah. But for it to go so badly wrong personally and professionally at Aston Villa, I was done. I felt like a circus freak that was just playing for time. Just playing for time. What am I going to do? Uh, what's going to happen next? What's going to be the next front page? I remember making the decision and saying to my family, my sister was a mental health nurse for a long time, and I said to her, Lynn, unless I do something, I'm having all of these thoughts and kind of, it's just not good. It's, it's very dark. And she said, look, Cock, go and take a second opinion from the physio. Went to the physio. Physio took me to a, um, a psychiatrist in Birmingham. And again, this is how I worry about young players that are in the system. Because the system will tell you whatever the system wants. And the psych uh, psychiatrist turned around to me and he said, you're playing Fulham tomorrow. He said, uh, and I understand that you're in the team. He said, score a couple of goals and you'll be daisy, you'll be on your way. A psychiatrist. Jesus. So I said, no, I'm going into the Rampton Priory. Went into the Rampton Priory. One newspaper that shall not be named um, said, Villa, Villa fans, drive this man out of your club. How can he say that he um, has clinical depression? It was the same thing because he earned so much. So it was so misunderstood. But the great decision was that by walking into the Rampton Priory for a month, having a phone call a month later from the physio, I said, we've just lost a couple of games, the gaffer wants you back. Played Leeds, I'd been prescribed antidepressants, and I was zonked out of my head. 45,000 people in Villa Park, and I, and I was like, where am I? It was mad. And I walked into the dressing room the next day, after the most stint in the Priory, and two players, I won't name them because they're still very much involved in, in, in the game, but both of them privately have said, I understand now, because we're all older, we all, we all grow up. The one turned round and the, the gaffer, John Gregory, had said, the players want to see you. I was like, the players want to see me? Well, f what for? And I'm sat there in my spec and this player stood up and he said, where the hell have you been for three weeks? And I said, 
I've been somewhere to be able to prolong my life for my kids and my family. Yeah. And they were great. This, this guy, after that, went, I understand it. One of the other guys that was quite vocal, he had mental health issues later on. I actually remember going to the Priory after that again for a week, and I came back, and Aston Villa had employed a psychologist and a psychiatrist, and there were four senior players around the table <laughs> talking to him. Wow. Um, so, strange times. I understand that, you know, some people that think the world is, you know, world is flat have changed their opinion since then. Um, but I do worry about younger players that are getting bombarded from all directions, criticism. I mean, imagine today you're, you're Marcus Rashford, um, incredible young man that said, I could actually say nothing. I'm quite a quiet, shy lad. Um, I, could, I could do my own thing in, in my part of Manchester, where I'm from, but instead I'm going to take on the government <laughs> and I'm going to stick my head above the parapet whilst playing for one of the world's biggest clubs, whilst being on social media and potentially open myself up to all sorts of criticism. I have nothing but respect for, for some of these guys. Tyrone Mings does it, Villa, he's very outspoken about racism and, and social issues. But for me... It would have been nice to have had some support and, and I hope youngsters get the support that they need now. And if you don't, younger players, call the PFA, call your agent, seek out old gnarly pros from years ago because there's plenty of them out there that will help you as well. Um, but at the time, this Liverpool experience that then manifested itself at Aston Villa um, was horrific. Well, I'm so glad that you, you got through it and yeah, you, yeah. you know, you're here with us uh, talking today. Going back to the decisions, final one, what would you say is the best and worst decision you made within football? Within football, after, after Villa, I went to play for, uh, for Leicester and I met Martin O'Neill and John Robertson and Steve Wolford, three great blokes. And strangely, that was the, a, a great decision because... I wasn't fit, I hadn't played for three months, and Mark, we were playing Watford away, my debut, me and Heskey up front. And Martin said, I know you haven't played, I know you've been struggling, go out, give me 20 minutes, and if you collapse, I'll come and carry you off. And I lasted the 90 minutes, because I thought, great, this is somebody again, this, John Robertson would always come in, I love you, big fella, pat on the back and what have you. Um, I wished I'd have played for Martin O'Neill. I wish Martin O'Neill had been a, a, my manager at one of those big clubs. Yeah. He managed Villa. He didn't manage Liverpool, but he managed Villa. So that was, that's, that's one kind of regret, but one great decision that late on in my career made me fall in love with the, the game again. But if there was one poor decision that I made in my career, it was probably going to Aston Villa when I did because I should have stuck it out at Liverpool and been in a position whereby I fought for my place a little bit more, showed a little bit more resilience and hung around in, in Liverpool, stayed in Liverpool, lived in Liverpool and had that experience for three or four years rather than two. And the best decision from a sort of how do you feel and sort of, you know, um, warm and fuzzy was, was signing for South End. The love and the affection and the appreciation I got from those people down there um, is the reason why I'm a football fan. It made me understand what football meant to people that didn't get a trophy every season, didn't get to a cup final every, every decade, and probably seen them be relatively poor all their lives. Yeah. But the outpouring of staying up in the division, in the championship, was, was real. So, yeah, best decision was signing for South End. Worst decision was the timing of going to Villa, for sure. Unbelievable. Brilliant. That was sensational, mate, and I can't thank you enough. Uh, pleasure. So You're good. welcome. Great insight. Good thank to see you. Thank you very you. much. <laughs> 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 Where's Chris Evans? <laughs> 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 Got to sign the desk. <laughs> <laughs>